millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Pursuing your future doesn't end at 40. In fact, it may mark the beginning of knowing who you are, what you're capable of, and what you really want. But knowing what's next and how to get there can be a challenge, especially when old narratives play on repeat. Liberty Road is here to share stories so that you can consider your possibilities, pursue your purpose, and move into your future with intention. I'm your host, Netta Jones, and we're here to listen, learn, and liberate dreams one episode at a time. Well, hello, Liberty listeners. Welcome to another episode of Liberty Road. Today, you guys get to hear from a duo. It's actually Garan Storé and Emily Yeston, and they are the founders of this new product line, Doré, who we got to talk to Garance about her launch of this, I don't know, maybe a year ago. And now we actually have, was it more than that? I don't know. I don't remember exactly. We'll post it in the show notes so you can hear (laughs) the way, way backstory. But it's so fun to have both of you on. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Emily, hey, take the first question. What is Doré? For all these people who don't know, what is it? What is it now? I would say now Doré is a modern French pharmacy skincare brand, sort of in its most essential form. We launched this line of skincare about two years ago, and it's really meant to be sort of your essentials when it comes to your skincare. So a range of products that are, you know, the only things you really need in your beauty closet. And that, the French pharmacy piece of it, I assume that's born of Garance, your background, or did I make that up? Yeah, I mean, I I think so. That's, uh, I mean, I like to imagine that I somewhat inspired Emily at some times in my life. I also think that as a French woman, I grew up in France. I left France when I was in my early 30s. I don't really often realize the culture because, you know, it's my culture. And Emily has always been very good at seeing what I represent for others, the type of culture I bring into the mix, like all these things. And so definitely comes from my background, my tastes also, you know, I'm very essentialist in many ways, aka lazy. And (laughs) Emily was able to see that. And that really helped. That helped me in the beginning when we were having the media. And it still helps me today uh, as we grow our little baby Doré. So let's talk about the media part for just a quick second. Mm -hmm. Emily, recap what Doré was And then we'll talk about the moment the both of you decided that that's not what it's going to be anymore. But just for those who perhaps have been hiding somewhere in a cave, what was (laughs) Doré? So Doré was a blog that Grant started back in 2006 that evolved from being, I would say, like a very personal platform and like a early blog into being a women's lifestyle digital media platform, which sounds very wordy, but really that's kind of what it came to be. We went from everything being strictly from Garance's point of view to building out a team that could sort of take that same point of view in essence and start to share additional stories through different lenses. And so we were always featuring interesting women or fashion, beauty, lifestyle, travel, all of the things that we were kind of interested in through a point of view that I would say was very French and European because it was coming from Garance at the beginning and something that we sort of evolved into capturing that spirit quite globally with teams that we were working with all over the place. I don't know internally what was happening, but externally what looked like, okay, they're pivoting. You guys were killing it. It seemed to be in your height. What, Garance, did you want Doré to be or become, or what were you bored with, or what happened that made you say, "Mm, I need to pivot here or shift? Well, one of my main flaws is I get bored about everything really, really fast. (laughs) It's true. The fact that Emily and I have been (laughs) working together for 
13 years shows how unboring she is because it's <laughs> it's really a problem in my life. I've changed everything hundreds of times. I'm trying to settle. Even growing my hair is a huge like challenge for me because I just want to go and cut it because I get bored. That's been kind of a challenge for me, but it's also been something that I think I can feel things really early, but mm. it was easy. And, and now in retrospect, even easier to see that it's not that we couldn't be successful. It's that we couldn't be successful on the terms that we wanted and that we had had. Mm. We had had the best terms for about 10 years. And I think for Emily, it was I was sometimes telling her, I was like, you know, it's not always like that, where you take the phone, people respond. You, you know, it's just like... I was very lucky to start at the beginning of a huge wave of digital media, and I was one of the first ones. And after a few years of opening doors, and that was difficult, then they just like <laughs> were completely open. So for a run of a little more than 10 years, not only was everything just flowy and joyful and easy and new and fresh, and finally everything came together. And I was like, oh my God, I can do photo and writing and talk about women and fashion and all the things I love without having, you know, a big system over me, a magazine or whatever. I knew it was fantastic, but it was very easy at the end to feel like, okay, the industry is forming around us. Money is becoming a thing. The joy and the freedom that we were feeling was starting to feel contrived. There was just so much that was changing. And so that was the exterior part. And we're like, where are we taking this? What do we want? Do we want to become Refinery29? Not really. We loved what they did. They're still good friends uh, and all that. But it wasn't our personality. So there, there were all these kind of questions. And we couldn't really answer them, which I think is always a sign. And on the internal side... I think we were just like, okay, we've done a lot. And there is also Instagram had arrived and mm. was starting to shift. And people didn't really need anyone to discover. I mean, at, at that time, that's what we were. Mm. You know, we were, were all the cool girls would meet, basically. And that's, you know, a lot of brands would come to us and be like, oh, we want to cast this person that I found on the street or that we found through, you know. And so that was going to be over very soon. And I think we didn't really, we talked about it, but it's, it was more of a general feeling. Mm. Emily, so I just want to get a little bit of your perspective here, because you meet Garance when she is essentially a blogger. Yeah. How do you come in and help somebody who is really writing about their perspective and their point of view and say, we're going to make this a business. This is a media company. Like, I'm going to help you do this. How does that actually happen? Because to date, her success had been with her camera and her pen, and she was doing her own thing. Well, definitely not strategically. It wasn't like I came in with like, oh, I have this vision for what your business is going to be. I mean, I was 22, and was working at Condé Nast and I was looking for a job as an editorial assistant. So I think at that time, Garance on her own had sort of realized that there's only so much that one person can do in any mm -hmm. platform and medium and that there was opportunity for bringing someone in to help with researching new people to feature, stories to tell, ideas and things like that. And that was originally where I came in was to be an editorial assistant within the business. And I think what we started to find in working together was I just kind of had a natural interest and knack for like the business side of things, which was not my intention at all. When we began working together, I never thought of myself as a business person or someone that was even interested in business, but it was just a thing that kind of naturally started to fall into place. And so I think what transpired from there was sort of a system where Garance would always be sort of the creative driving force. And then I would start to bring systems into place to help support that creativity. And I think that's also how we work on the business now as well as, you know, the infrastructure piece bringing together more of the visionary piece. There was no strategy around how this would evolve. It was just something that happened really naturally and really organically, I think, based on our unique skill sets and the pairing of the two of them together mm -hmm. in a place that had, I think, so much trust and communication that we could kind of run with it without overthinking it too much or being worried about what it would be. It just happened really naturally. 
So at the time when Garance is getting bored with this and you've put all these <laughs> systems into place and she says to you, are you guys having tea one morning? And she says, I'm bored. What what happened? If I can take this one, I yeah. uh, <laughs> because it's, it's going to put Emily in a difficult situation. It's literally like I was stepping back without really telling anyone. And Emily was just like playing whack-a-mole were the places that I left empty. <laughs> and it wasn't that I didn't want it. It's that just, I, I have a problem with freedom. Like I really need it so much. And it's, it's a blessing and a curse. And that's probably the tension that's keeping us together is that Emily builds the systems and I found <laughs> And I'm just like, I'm struggling with them as much as I love them. And at that time, I was starting to suffer. And we talked about that, I think, in the mm -hmm. first uh, podcast. Yeah. From all the incredible things that had happened, I didn't know who I was anymore, what I wanted. And I started taking steps back. And basically, I flee to LA, where I kind of crash landed, more or less, and then... Emily, she was in New York and I feel like in a way I sort of abandoned the ship for a little bit and I think that also our audience felt it and I wasn't talking about it because I think when you're going through something difficult like a depression or a burnout, I couldn't word it and it's also very funny because it was about 10 years ago, about, yeah, it was that 39 and nobody would talk about that online. Now, yeah. everybody talks about Everybody's it. Everybody's tired. But just like, say, when yeah. I talked about it a few years later, people were like, thank you, this is amazing and all that. I don't know, it's another conversation. But Emily was left in New York. I mean, she had a great team and she's a very strong leader. It's, it's important to say, I think, that when you lead a company with, um, when you're new and you're young, me and Emily, we made a lot of mistakes, you know, and there was a lot mm. of things where we probably would do it very differently if it was today. And that's totally okay because the story is still an amazing story to tell. Yeah. Did those lessons, have those lessons transferred, Emily, into this new business? And you're making new mistakes, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I mean, I for sure, I think there's some things that now we've been through a certain history and story together. We know the way that we would do things, like to do things when it comes to things around content and storytelling and even the way that we hire and think about building teams and all of that. Now that we're in a product-based industry, it's a whole new system to learn. It's a completely different business. And so there's definitely a whole handful of new mistakes that we're making that have to do with inventory and product development and retail and like navigating all of the stuff that we never really had to do before. But I do think, you know, there is a foundation there that comes from the 10 plus years that we had with the blog and being able to bring that history and that story to this business has definitely, I think, been an advantage in a huge way and something that I'm, I'm super grateful for. Thank you for that. I'm going to go back to this one more time. When oh, yeah. you guys decide, so Garance goes to LA and she's having her, really the beginnings of what I think a lot of women are having, whether it's menopause or perimenopausal or just what is happening with my life, whether they've had success, which I think Garance, you've talked about, yours was almost like masked behind all of the success. But I think for a lot of women, it's the lack of success. You come to this place of what am I? Where am I going? Why am I doing what I'm doing or not doing what I want to be doing? Whatever the case. It is different. And I, and I think it's important to say to go through a moment like that when you've had a success yeah. than it is when you haven't had it. Because I have some of my friends who haven't had it or consider they haven't. And I'm telling them, are you kidding me? You have three amazing kids you know, or yeah. some, but they consider that they haven't. I felt like I had a little like gift or like a little treasure. And that was that I had a name that I had made a name for myself. I mean, I talk often with people about that because whether it's Emily or me or, or you, it's an important thing, you know, mm. yeah, it's difficult to do. And so it's a treasure when you have it. And I, I, I don't want to 
kind of brush over that. I appreciate that. And do you think that the gift that it is can sometimes make the questions of who am I and what am I doing more difficult because you're doing that publicly? Or do you think, oh, I'm just so grateful that I had it. I'd rather have that than be on the other side of what am I and where am I going and I haven't accomplished anything? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think any, no yeah. t- at no time was I like, oh, I'd rather start from zero. I'm grateful for that because also I feel very lucky. I know that I have talents and I, I work, but I also came at a time and, you know, timing is so important. If I was mm. starting now, it would be a very different thing. If we had started Dore without what we had created before, it would be very mm. different. I am friends with women that are on every side of this, but I think it's okay to say what we create in the first moments of our life, like in the first yeah. 20s or 30s or something can help us when we go through these moments. I think for me, it was very reassuring because I was like, whatever happens now, if I decide to just, you know, open a coffee shop and which is a scenario that I think very like, you know, lovely and attractive, I will have proven something to myself. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was very important because I had to prove something to my parents, to like a lot of things. And that moment in my career took care of that. So that was a weight that I wasn't carrying on my shoulders. Whether it's a good way to carry, I don't think it is, but I had it. It's honest and I appreciate you. Yeah. It's one of the fun things in talking to you or even listening to you is that you use your transparency for good, not oh, just not you. just to leave things open-ended, but they seem thank to you. land somewhere. So Emily, you see all this happening. You see Garance in LA, you see her pulling back and you decide, okay, we need to pivot or what's going on with you? No, so we had started doing these retreats. This was like a new kind of business idea that we had was to start doing these retreats with our readers, which were amazing. Um, And still like probably some of the highlights of uh, that time for us with the blog. They were incredible. It was like our woo-woo moment. We were like in a little (laughs) bit of a spiritual place too. And so Garance and I decided for research that we would go to a silent meditation retreat together, which is like maybe an idea of torture for G, a little bit of (laughs) like... (laughs) <laughs> like heaven for me, but doing it together, very challenging. And so we went to this silent meditation retreat at Spirit Rock in Northern California for a week where we stayed in a really tiny room together. It was like a dorm room, basically, but we're not supposed to talk to each other because I'm like, was very much like a goody two shoes growing up, like need to be perfect <laughs> with everything. Like I'm terrible with that. I'm such a rule follower, like all of those (laughs) things. I was like, oh, of course I'm going to respect the silence and not talk and like be in the thing and do it all the way it's supposed to be done, blah, blah, blah. And G the whole time kept trying to like, hey, hey, hey. I'm trying to talk to her. And I was very like, stop it. Like, (laughs) don't talk to me. She was very strong. Read this sign. Read this sign. (laughs) Read the sign. But I was in it. I was having a moment. It was a really cathartic experience for me, I think, because... A lot of what G is saying rings true. Like I have always been someone who has like such an idea of success and perfection. And like, I see things all the way through. And that definitely comes from upbringing and childhood and all of that. But I felt like at that retreat, for me personally, I had a moment of like, we're done with the blog. This is not a thing Mm -hmm. that we need to do anymore. And like, actually it's okay. I think I was trying to continue to like make it work because I felt like if I said that we shouldn't do this anymore. It would be a failure instead of just like the closing of one chapter and the start of something else. And I think finally at that retreat, like I had that sort of realization moment that like this was not really sustainable anymore for either of us. It was so much pressure, I think, that I was putting on myself. Mm. And we had a pretty big team at that time. Still today, it's a thing. I'm working on it. It's We're never perfect, but we're always trying, right? But yeah, it was intense. And so During that retreat, I sort of gave myself permission to be like, it's okay if this is not like the thing that's going to keep pushing forward and and we can move on to something else. So we left the retreat, went our separate ways and didn't really talk about all of that and then called each other shortly after. And that was where we had the conversation of like, I think it's time to sort of wind down what we're doing with the blog and figure out what the next thing is, whether that's something we do together or whatever it's going to be. But We just knew it was kind of time to close that chapter. Yeah, I was going to ask, was there a 
closing of one chapter and let's get excited about the next or it sounds like you didn't know what was next no No, we didn't know I think it's important to let things die yeah and to feel the grief and we had been on a high for and some lows for 10 years about like together we knew we loved each other but we didn't know what our story would be you know because being friends and being in business together it's like completely different and I love working with Emily she understands me more than anyone I think she's exceptional I think there were really moments where we pushed each other in in a good way and I was really sad really sad that Mm. this was going to go we hadn't told each other we're going to keep going I think she was a bit tired of me because I could I can be really annoying you're being too hard on yourself G (laughs) <laughs> well, I I think I'm being, I mean, yesterday, somebody else told me that. And I was like, <laughs> yes. That you're annoying? No, that I'm, that I, that I'm too hard on myself. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm annoying for sure at some moments. Um, <laughs> I think but, we all are. Yeah, yeah, we all are. But sometimes I feel like, you know, it's, again, like it's, it's this thing. You have this big personality and you're creative and all that. And you're also a bit narcissistic. You can be like, you know, there's just like all these things that come with it. But I can understand that sometimes for someone that's also creative, that has, you know, the world in front of them, that's arriving into her thirties and being like, yeah, well, I want to see what the world looks without this mm. big character next to me. You know, I totally get it. Nonetheless, I was quite sad. Yeah. Because I know what life looks without Emily in it. I had it before. That's very, it's very sweet. But I want to just point out that what you just said and your ability to see her as separate and want the best for her is not that of a narcissist. So we'll just call that out. (laughs) So when do the two of you get back together and say, I know it's going to be a French pharmacy line of- yeah skincare like when how does that happen it's all emily i mean not all but like it's her idea yeah again timing is so important in all of this as well like i i think you know there's that question and like how i built this how much of it was like effort and how much of it was luck well i think timing is the other part of that so we went on that silent meditation retreat in august of 2019 and we were like okay let's take our time to like wind things down and sort of see what happens not knowing that a global pandemic was coming at the beginning of 2020. And so we did a bunch of things really right in that we decided to let go of our office space before then. We had started to lay off the team and they were able to get jobs before the pandemic started. Like there were many things that happened. Yeah, Yeah, like we had no idea, but it just, there were certain things that worked out that felt really, really good. But when the pandemic happened, it was kind of like a, oh God, well, like, what's the world going to look like in a few months from now? Like, I don't think any of us have any idea. And so we sort of took that time as like a, let's wait and see. Let's keep the, like, the skeleton crew kind of here and keep the lights on because at the same time, like, we were done with the blog as it was, but it was also an asset that we felt like was valuable and we had done something with. And to just, like, shut it off and walk away entirely didn't feel 100% like the right thing for us to do. So we were sort of figuring out Did it have a home somewhere else? Was there something else it could evolve into? And I feel like we took the first like six months of the pandemic to just not really do anything. I feel like I napped a lot during that time. I like recovered (laughs) from like all the stress. Yeah. No, I did. I launched my newsletter. Oh, you did. Yeah, you did. (laughs) After a few months. It's true. It's true. I launched it in June of 2020, right? Yeah, in June. Yeah, that was a big thing for me. And it was the first proof that we had done the right thing because Mm. one of the things that happened as we were growing the blog is that I had lost the intimacy that I was feeling with the audience because it was big. And you know, because you've read me that I'm very open in everything I talk about. And I started writing a newsletter just like that. Just I needed to communicate. I, I was missing this contact with my readers that were still there. And I'm like, what are you doing? The newsletter was growing really fast. And I was like, I'm going to run into the same problem where I feel like it's too big and I can't talk about the things that I like to talk about anymore. And that's when I put it behind a paywall, which was very early. Substack was only starting and all that. So, And that's something that I think brought life back inside of me. And I remember that as a consumer, as a reader. Mm -hmm. I remember, one, I wanted 
to hang on to my connection to the brand. And then to see that there was access to this person, it seemed like you were granting us permission (laughs) into this deeper relationship, which only confirmed the foundation that Dore was for what Dore is now. It's sort of like, oh, I I know these guys, so of course I'm going to buy the product Mm. because, you know what I mean? There was something about how transparent you were that I believed was going to come through the product. And I only say that to say, so did so many other people. Mm. And so, Emily, you then can look at all of this and say, we do still have something. And the newsletter even expanded that or deepened that. Maybe that's the better word. Yeah, it was interesting because I think we were trying to find our footing. And so, you know, when G launched the newsletter, which I thought was great, I feel like we've always been very supportive of each other's like endeavors and those kinds of things, which is also Mm -hmm. super important. It was really cool. But I was like, I don't know how this relates to like anything that we might do someday or what that looks like or anything like that. And I mean, I remember like at some point being like, I guess maybe I should start looking for a new job. Like I, maybe we are just going to like let this thing go and G's found this other thing and who who knows what it'll be. It's like a relationship literally because at the same time I was like, Emily doesn't want to work with me anymore. I'm going to have to like, you know, she does, she's done with me. I'm going to have to do my own thing. And we never talked about this. Yes. I thought she was like, oh, come on. Just like, I'm going to go on my own. I'm going to do my things. And we never talked about it. I had no idea what I was going to do after that. Um, But I was talking to a friend about all of this, like this sort of like, I don't know where my life is going, what's happening. And she's like, oh, well, you guys should obviously start a beauty brand. And I was like, why would we ever start a beauty brand? Like that was the most out of left field thing at that time. And it's, it shouldn't have been surprising to me because a year prior, we had someone who had reached out to G about starting like a Corsican Mm. beauty brand. And so it was an avenue that we had sort of Mm -hmm. explored a little bit, but never so seriously that I felt like it would be the next chapter for us. So I totally like waved that friend off in that conversation and just moved on with my life. And a few weeks later, I was buying a micellar water on Amazon. And it was sort of like one of those light bulb moments where I was like, oh, but no one's done anything in the French pharmacy space in such a long time. And it was like, one of those things where everything just like clicks into place in your head where you're like, we're the only ones who could really do that with authenticity because of Garance and who she is and what the audience is and what she's represented to them specifically in the lens of beauty and the other women that we've featured that are French that have talked about their experiences with pharmacy brands and all of those things. It was like, I could just see it. And so I remember talking to my husband about it and being like, is this a crazy idea? And he was like, no, I think it's actually makes a lot of sense. I called G being like, I have this idea, but like, what if the best way out of the blog is basically through a new incarnation of the brand? And this is what I think it could be. And she had the same reaction I had with my friend. Why would we start a beauty brand? There's so many out there. There's no need to do that. And I just thought, okay. But then a couple of days later, she called me back and I feel like she had the same sort of experience that I had where all of a sudden it kind of like clicked and she could see it in the same way that it sort of clicked for me and I saw it. And so the conversation was like, we can do this, but we're only interested in doing this together. Like that was sort of the whole idea around getting this off the ground and starting it. So, I mean, I remember talking to Josh, my husband being like, we're going to do this. It's going to be like heads down in the weeds for the next many years. But I think that this is like a real business that we could scale in a way that never felt possible with what we were doing before with the blog. And to me, that was exciting because this was a totally new challenge and a business that I had never even considered being capable of building. And I think we all, I mean, maybe not all of us, but I like to be challenged. I like to learn new things. Like that's exciting to me. So, so that was kind of how this all happened. And that was in the fall of 2020 when we decided to to start working on this. So you had the better part of, I guess, that year or six months yeah. to really be thinking about as the world was unsure of what was happening, you guys could pause, right? You didn't feel like you were missing anything. You could no. pause and think about what's possible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So you guys have been together for 13 years. Well, 10 years at the time. You know what it's like to work with each other. You have a new idea. It's a fresh start to rewrite the rules of how we're going to work with each other again. What changed? Whether it was a role or just a conversation about, hey, but this time I want to X, Y, Z. 
I don't think we really had that. No. I think the only thing is that now it was not Emily working for me as a person, kind mm. of. You know, it's always a conflict in a brand and all that when you have a founder that's kind of known. But now, you know, it was all about Dore was the baby. I wasn't the baby anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, I think, what one of the things that changed. But... I think it was more like, oh, we know each other. And so we know our strength and we know our flaws and we know what the other needs. Do you remember anything like that? No, we never had a conversation of like, okay, this is what it's going to be. And this is how we're going to do it and all of that. It, It came kind of naturally. And I feel like we sort of, started building the business around each other because we knew Mm -hmm. what to expect from one another. And I think, Mm -hmm. again, it's also a a living, breathing thing that continues to evolve. Like as we learn more about what the business needs, I feel like the way that we're working continues to shift. It's interesting because we were just together last week in France for our launch at Gallery Lafayette. We were working on other sides of the country for a long time when G was in LA and I was in New York. So Like we see how much great stuff happens when we're together in the same place. And with a brand that is such a baby now that needs so much care and, Mm. you know, feeding of ideas and and things like that, that's a new thing that we're trying to navigate. How we can find that time and those moments to be together to give the brand everything that it needs while also like we've built pretty interesting lives too in kind of remote places. So that's like a new thing that we're navigating through in this moment. Where are you, Emily? I live on Cape Cod now. Yeah. And Garance is in Somerset. So we both have yeah. these like country lives that we've built, but <laughs> we're doing such a like urban thing with the brand. So it's, yes, it's interesting. It probably brings a new perspective though, from both of you leaving New York, right? A new perspective to what beauty is, what clean beauty is. When you think about putting that brand together and what you wanted it to stand for, Garance, I'll ask you, because of the French piece of it, what was essential? It has to be this. Well, the first thing I think was that we knew that beauty, it was turning a page in terms of the standards that it was setting for itself. And for us, it wasn't the question that it had to be clean beauty, it had to be sustainable. These to us were just like, breathing it 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 wasn't even something that we were going to make the first claim of the brand you know when these movements started brands would come out and that's what they would sell you it's like oh we're clean yeah but what do you do we want this to be the background of everything we do is you know that people will trust us because we're doing real clean beauty real sustainability and all that and then it was all about the knowledge that we had developed over all these years and obviously our personalities. I'm not somebody who's going to do a 10 step routine in the morning. Um, I like things to be easy and quick. So there was this aspect. So, you know, we just built on all of these things. We just were very clear that we needed to do something that resembles who we are because we've had the experience of trying to be not who we were before because, Mm. you know, we were taken in that system with our our blog and all that. And we were like, there's going to be no concession because I think Emily's actually more like me than sometimes like where she can't be inauthentic. Yeah. Mm. And so for me, it was very difficult when I was, you know, working for brands where I didn't completely believe in their products, which obviously happened, you know, but it was really difficult. So we wanted to be very authentic so we can stand behind everything we do, Yeah, which is the case. And I think too, like we actually, even though Garance grew up in France, we grew up with a similar approach to beauty. Yeah, I grew up with drugstore brands. Mm -hmm. I remember my mom used the same Olay moisturizer basically until we launched Dore, like for her entire (laughs) life. So, you know, like that's what I grew up with. It was always drugstore. It was never prestige. It was always super accessible. And I know we had access to this like incredible beauty closet for years, which was amazing. But when it came to thinking about like how I would actually purchase beauty, I was not someone that would naturally go towards like a higher end, more prestige or luxury product. And I never spent a lot of money on that. And then also like the more complex my skincare routine got, like the worse my skin got. And I was having Mm. all sorts of skin issues. So 
that sort of like essentialism had always been a part of how we both experienced beauty. We had been tempted into the world of like trying all the fancy, expensive things with lots of fragrance and lots of actives and all of that. But what we grew up with and what we kept coming back to were more of like the basics that we knew that we could trust. And we really just wanted to make them modern for today's consumer. And I do think, and maybe this is, I would say, part of the like great thing about not being beauty industry people who started a beauty brand is that I think a lot of the industry talks to itself a lot and thinks that the Mm -hmm. consumer sort of is the person that works in the industry. And most of the women that I know, like a lot of my friends are young moms right now too, like they're happy if they've washed their face and maybe put a moisturizer on. Like they're not, (laughs) do you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people that were like using bar soap to wash their face up until very recent or maybe still are like, they're not interested in the complexity. I think that the industry is like pushing and I think that's changed a lot with like younger generation, but I think the customer that we're talking to is who we are. So like I'm in my mid thirties, Garance is going to be 49 soon. And I don't think that we're like the obsessive beauty junkies. There are a lot of people in the market that are not into that and are obsessed with that kind of information around ingredients and all that. They just want something that's going to work and it's not going to cost them a lot of money and they can feel good about using it. And so we really wanted to create something that would talk to that woman because that's who we are too. It strikes me as you guys are talking, and this is something I want our listeners to hear, that you don't have to push your way into creating something. You just have to listen to yourself. Because as you were talking, Emily, about your own story of what you used growing up, and then juxtaposing that to what's in the market today, you could see the white space building. I could see it. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, she's right. Oh, yeah, she's Mm -hmm. right. There isn't anything. Oh, yeah, there isn't anything that's modern. And it was like, as you just kept coming up with your own story, the collective story of the both of you, it took that curiosity and that pause to see what do we have to offer to the space. And then the physically, the product in the beauty space is wildly different. The color that you're using, the simplicity of the name, there's so much about it that's stark relative to what else we're seeing out there. Who was in charge of that decision because it's really, it's such a strong brand. Yeah, we worked with, uh, you know, a, a designer yeah. uh, to help us because that's not none of our jobs. Emily was very clear that, you know, she wanted color. So that's usually how it works. It's, there's this kind of like back and forth. And then we already wanted to take something from what we had created before. We were actually happy with our logo. Mm -hmm. The main inspiration for me and for Emily too, I think, was the French pharmacy products in the 60s and 70s. These very bold colors. And we wanted to bring that spirit back. Mm. We wanted something that was very like cut through the noise. Yeah. And I think definitely I had a strong touch in like, creating the logo and just spacing and things like that but it was really collaborative and Emily was very clear because at some point I was like I was struggling with the color and I was like why don't we just do white it's so beautiful white is the best and she's like no no white I feel like that's where a lot of logic just comes into it like Mm -hmm. a lot of people because it was the pandemic are shopping online if you look at an e-commerce page with a bunch of moisturizers on it How are you going to stick out if your product is white like everybody else is? So it was just a lot of like thinking about it from a very common sense point of view. And even too, we were like, okay, well, we know we want it to go into stores because based on the price point, volume is important. And so retail distribution is going to be a thing. We want to cut down on secondary packaging as much as possible. So not having like boxes on our products so that we're doing less waste. Okay, well, if you're doing that and your product is sitting on the shelf is it going to get damaged in the stock room and get dirty if it's white? Probably. And then your product's not going to look great on the shelf. So is there a color you can use that will help from a merchandising standpoint, but also allow a product to get thrown around in a stock room and still look decent without, you know, a little markup here and there. So it was a lot of just thinking through kind of tactically, like it's not a science that you learn. So it's just really thinking with common sense, which I think is how we've done a lot of things. It's just like intuition, common sense, and being like quite logical about stuff. And that was how we approached 
coming up with the color and the packaging the way that it is and all of those different elements. Yeah, it probably was a stark difference than any color you wear, any color you have in your home, any color that you would gravitate toward in terms of your own personal design. Because I understand Garan saying, oh, white, it would be so pretty. And it would have been. But I was in a credo and I saw your stuff there. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's wildly different than anything that's around it. So it was such a smart move. And to the consumer, it's a Mm go-to. We know where it is in the store. And the more and more it, it gets into these stores, the more we build that relationship with it. So well done. There's so many other questions I have, but I need to keep us on track. So I want to ask you guys how age has informed the way you look at business. Emily, you said you started when you were in your early 20s with Garance. Garance, you had started years before that in your work really as a fashion blogger. What is different now that you guys are in these different seasons of your life? How do you each see your age playing a role in the business that you're creating and what you want to accomplish through Doré? Garance, I'll start with you. Yeah, there's so much in this question. I think for me, I thought I had no vision after 40. Mm -hmm. I I remember when I was 30, I was like, what's a woman after 40? I don't know. It's just like, how am I going to be? I don't know. And so I'm walking. It's like a kind of a cartoon where every time I put one new step, it animates, right? And I'm like, oh, okay, this is what, this is how it feels like. And it's a wonderful adventure. It's really nothing like I had imagined. I think we're told so much nonsense every day, all the time about everything. And I think one of my favorite things to do is to find the truth. And the truth is never black or white. It's never easy. It's never, you know, you're talking about this, like, I don't have kids. It was a big moment in my life, but it's not something where, you know, it's not one sentence. It's not, oh, that's great. Or, oh, that's horrible. No, it's life. It's like a million things. And that's, I see that as, you know, as I said, every time I put a step on the floor, flowers grow, you know, like in a Disney movies and and I'm trying to keep that spirit and that's kind of the freshness that I want to bring to Doré is we all do what we can with what we have at a moment in our life but there is not so many differences I think between being 30 and, and 50 I mean it's that spirit of discovery I definitely have wrote that in my newsletter last week. Yeah. I realize how important it is to look good. Mm-hmm. It's one of the things that as I get smarter, wiser, older, like more experienced, I realize, wow, it's much more important than I ever thought, much more philosophically important for a reason that I think we can't explain. Taking care of yourself and looking what you think is good, not the world, but like sure. women go through these moments where our life's falling apart. There is always a moment like that. And I realized with my friends and even with me, as long as they look good, they can make it to the next day. So mm. beauty is just so important. And if we can have a role in that, in like keeping things together, giving a little bit of, I don't know, this, this moment of self-care, I think it's actually very, very cool and very important. I like that you've been able to distill it sort of philosophically into something that we can practically engage with. Yeah, right? I didn't even think of that, but yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. I think when I'm 60, I'm going to think, oh, I really want to look good. <laughs> you know, I thought after 40, I would be like, oh, yeah, whatever. I always had this image because, you know, I always had trouble with food and all that. I was like, when I'm old, I'm going to let myself eat whatever I want. <laughs> it is funny. I mean, I'll tell you, I'm 56. And as you were talking, I was thinking, I feel like I have to represent something because my brand is saying, hey, it's cool to be older than 40. In fact, it's so cool that you have this whole world ahead of you. There's so much possibility. There's so much for you to consider. But in order for me to 
believe that other people will buy that message, I feel like I have to look a certain way. And I <laughs> I have seen myself sort of step back like, oh, I'm not as cool as I'm trying to make the brand. How do I <laughs> step into that at my age? It's very awkward. And I probably shouldn't have said that on the podcast. But no, that's it's very true. interesting because those questions definitely come up. And it's important to think yeah. about them. It's honest. Yeah, definitely. It, it is, it's yeah. honest. And I think you have that at any age, too. Like, yes. am I cool enough for my brand? It's not about age. Yeah. I'm going to rely on the uh, people we surround the brand with. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, no, you're very cool. <laughs> yeah. Have to worry. Thank you. Garant said I'm cool in my, in my day now. <laughs> Emily, how about for you? So 35 feels like everything is an option. Everything is an opportunity. It's interesting because as you start to get to this age, I feel like I was like a young maverick for so long. And now I'm like, well, I'm not mm. that, I'm still young, but I'm not that young anymore where it's like not yeah. that impressive everything that I'm doing. It's like, this feels, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I I, yes. I don't know. I, I think it's yes. kind of funny. Like, and for yeah. a while, I remember like we would always talk because I, I think I look fairly young also. And so it was always like, how can I make myself look older and more sophisticated so people will take me seriously? I don't think I have to worry about that as much anymore, which is great. <laughs> I also feel like I'm at a stage where there's still so much ahead of me, hopefully, that like this is just super exciting and I'm enjoying being very in it and very present in this right now. This is really like I was saying to G the other day, like my life is pretty boring in that like I'm basically just working all the time, but the work is so interesting and so exciting that like that's that's what's fueling and feeding me right now. And I'm not looking for something in other parts of my life to like bring yeah. more in, which is really cool. And it also feels like whatever happens with this business, like there's still, there's still probably many things ahead for me in terms of what my work life will look like and what life will be in general. And so it's kind of cool to know that, I don't know, there's still just so much to look forward to. Yeah, I think the other thing too is, you know, when you're starting in a new industry, I think we all sort of have a general level of like insecurity of like, do I know what I'm doing? Like, and I think I finally gotten to the point too now where I've realized that like no one actually knows what they're doing. And so that insecurity, which I definitely had in a big way, maybe even a couple of years ago is something that I feel like has started to roll off my shoulders a little bit more. And that feels really nice. Well, the fact that you're learning that at your age is brilliant because I think I figured that out like two weeks ago. It's like, oh, nobody knows what they're doing. Okay, this is awesome. I can have these conversations now. I can hold my head up high. I'm in good company. Okay, I have to get us into the fast five. I'll just go toggle back and forth. Garance, share a daily practice that has kept you grounded. Oh, just walking my dog in nature. Yeah. Yeah. Emily? I have started like exercising every morning and it I need it. It's like the best thing ever that I've started to do this. What kind of exercise? I do the Sculpt Society. I'm like obsessed with it. I feel awesome after I do it. And doing it in the morning versus after work is a new thing that I just started doing. And it's been a game changer for me. Is it like a Pilates kind of thing or? Kind ish? of. Yeah, it's great. It's like a little dance, a little Pilates. It feels good to move. And I don't think about anything while I'm doing it. And I think that's what I enjoy the most about it. You have to go see the Kristen Wiig SNL skit oh my about God, yes, Pilates. Did you it. see that? Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. For everybody listening, if you haven't seen it, watch it. Um, yes. And then what, Garants, are you currently reading? I just ordered a book from my friend, Stacey Dugwood. She used to write the column Mademoiselle in the UKL. And when they stopped it, I was just miserable. And anyway, she had exactly what uh, we talked about, this kind of crazy life moment, divorce, like kids, whatever. And she used to be this kind of Carrie Bradshaw, like, you know, and so she wrote the book about that. And uh, I just ordered it. So I'm very excited to receive okay. it. We'll include that in the show notes. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Emily? What are you reading? I can't believe I haven't read it before, but I'm reading Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. So it's like his story about Nike. Yeah. I was just feeling in a moment where I wanted to be like very brand inspired. So I just started that a couple days ago. Okay. And then Garans, what's your go-to beauty hack? And this can be with a Dore product or without. I don't have hacks. You, you just use all the products. I believe in just like simple, easy moisturize, clean gently. Yeah, I, I, I believe in all these things and I do a little bit of Botox, but that's not a hack. It's very simple. Yeah. Very simple. Yeah, for me. Sorry, Em, now you're going to have to have a hack. <laughs> she doesn't have a 
hack no either. Pressure. We're no pressure. We're not hack people. <laughs> we're not hackers. Yeah. We're yeah. not, we're, we're not, we're not beauty hackers. I think it speaks well of you guys. It, it represents the brand. It's very consistent with everything else that you've said. <laughs> Would you say the same, like using the product? And Yeah, I don't. Yeah. No, I really don't have a hack. Like if you really can't be bothered to like wash your face before you go to bed, please use micellar water. Like that's my, my hack is like, if I'm feeling very lazy, I guess, just like I always would use that, but it's not a hack. That's just what I do anyway. So I don't know. It's not a hack for you, but I bet for some people listening, they're going to be like, oh, I can do that. That's a replacement. So we'll call it a hack. Oh, I want to say something though. Yeah. I'll call, I'll call makeup a bit of a hack. Okay. And I think our skins are supposed to have pores you know, oh, yep. <laughs> our skins are supposed to be a little bit imperfect if you get really close. I think people have been fooled into thinking that they have to have naturally flawless skins. And so what I do, I don't have perfectly flawless skin, but I put a little bit of makeup. Yeah. And I think it's very important because if your skin looks like a baby skin, it's because you are probably going too hard on it. Yeah. And yeah. you should be more careful. If I'm 49, I'm not supposed to have the skin of a 16-year-old. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. So my hack is a little bit of makeup. A little bit of makeup. So does that mean that Dore will ever have makeup? You have to ask Emily. She's the one with the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll stay tuned. We'll yeah, stay, stay tuned. tuned. How about that? You, you can come on uh, the podcast for that. <laughs> and then... Garantz, please share one thing that you have loved or not loved about midlife. Midlife? Okay. I really want the thing you've loved, but I also know you're going to be honest, so I'm giving you that opportunity. (laughs) (laughs) The thing I love, I think it's very freeing. You know, I think you have less choices, so you're more free. So that's the thing that I I love. I wish I had less choices before because I'm as Emily very well knows, I can't make a choice. So usually I leave it. It's like the, with the children thing. I left it until the end. And then I was like, oh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> oops. <laughs> uh, it was a weird journey, but anyway. And Emily, what are you looking forward to? Maybe something that you've seen modeled in Garance or in other women around you? Yeah. Well, I think because I'm at that age where there's an expectation that I'm probably ready to have kids, even though I don't want to have kids. I'm ready. I can't wait to Mm. not have to explain that anymore once I get to a certain age. So that I'm looking forward to. It's a hard thing. Yeah. The pressure. Yeah. There, I mean, it's a whole podcast. Yeah. uh, I did the opposite of G I made, instead of waiting to not make a choice, I made a choice very early (laughs) and I'm like, I'm sticking with my choice. I feel good about my choice. I mean, I know I could change that choice if I want to, Sure. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. But yeah. then having to explain that choice is uh, kind of sucks. So I'll be happy when that. Well, but when you're on the, on the other side of it, people kind of feel bad for you. It's like, oh, poor, poor her. She couldn't have kids. So you have that thing. So whatever you do anyway. Yeah. If you don't have children, you do, you're damned if you don't. people are going to have a, an, <laughs> yeah. like a thing. Yeah. They're going to be so like. So that's what I'm not looking yeah. forward to <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> But nobody's asking, I mean, no one's asking your husband, Emily, like, you're not having kids. Like, it's such a weird, maybe his mom, I don't know. But people just in general don't don't ask that of men. And I think, look, it's not just society, it's other women. We've done damage, too, of asking those questions. And so I bring it up just to say, like, maybe we should start paying attention to those who are making those intentional choices and not put that weird pressure on them. I'd rather people ask me. Uh, it's not like I couldn't have them or I decided not to have them. It's a gray, a lot of yeah. gray areas. Like I tried IVF, but it didn't work. But then, da, da, da. but yeah. I'd rather try to shorten that, you know, than have someone feel bad for me. Yeah. I feel like these conversations should be easier to have, even though for having been through moments of despair, I can understand that for some women, it's a tough subject and that... Sure. They don't want to be asked anything. So it's sure. It's definitely a sensitive, very important subject to talk about. A new framing of the same question. Yeah, a so new question. <laughs> two sides to every coin, right? Yes. And, you know, this podcast is called Liberty Road. And the idea here is that our listeners get to hear 
women who are doing really cool things, 40 plus, and bringing 35-year-olds along for the ride, Emily. What does it mean for you to be liberated, Garance? And I'm going to check and see if you answered the same way in the last podcast. Uh, Yeah, what did I say last time? (laughs) I don't remember. I have to go back and listen. I mean, I've always been looking for freedom. It's just my natural thing is to leave any situation where I don't feel free. So there's that, there's that part. You know, we were talking before how kind of hard I can be on myself. I totally agree and Mm. I shouldn't. But at the same time, it's the only way that I found to free myself from my mental prisons. And to me, that's the most important thing. It's like when I see what I do, because I have patterns like everyone, and I'm going to name them. And when I'm a little bit hard on myself, but at the same time, I'm opening the doors of that mental prison that I created for myself. You know, our dreams can become our prisons sometimes. Mm -hmm. And liberty to me is when you finally open the door and you're like, that dream wasn't for me. Let's create a new one. You did a beautiful job of writing about that recently, a couple of weeks ago, right? I did a little bit and I talked also about it on one of my lives. Yeah, but that will probably come as a bigger thing at some point because I think we are sold so many dreams and I think we have to... We have to start talking about the fact that it's not all that, you know, we're sold or whatever. A lot lot of those dreams are also there is social media and all that making a terrible job at showing us the image, but not what's happening in the backstage. So, yeah, something will come out of this. When it does, let me know. We'll, okay. we'll link to it. Because it's, right. it's a big piece of, you know, even I feel the, the pressure of when I talk about the dreams that women have had that are unrealized. And my hope is that our platform helps them to realize those dreams. I also realize some people don't have dreams. Some people need to let go of those dreams. Some mm-hmm. people, like that dream is not serving them. It's actually hurting them. And so mm-hmm. when you use that that mental prison and talked about dreams, it it made me think I have to rethink the way I invite people into moving toward something that gives them purpose. That's different than holding on to a dream or person, right? Yes, it is. So thank you. You gave me, I think, really thoughtful language to consider. Well, thank you. Thank you. I think the tool is creativity. And I think, you know, people often talk about creativity as like, oh, you build this beautiful piece of art or you created a beautiful business. But the number one use we have of creativity is to recreate our lives, you know, and create as many dreams as we need until we find the one that works for us. Okay. So, Emily, what does being liberated mean to you? Liberated from my own self-limiting beliefs most of the time. Otherwise, Mm -hmm. I feel pretty liberated in my life otherwise. but She is. She's more than me, actually, Mm. uh, liberated in her life. Yeah. Thank you both so much for this time and for hanging out with me and with our listeners. Thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you so much. It's always such a great time. You're doing such a wonderful, wonderful work. Really, I mean it. Thank you. Thank you. And Liberty listeners, thank you so much for spending this time with Emily and Garance and with me. And we look forward to talking to you guys again next week. Bye for now. Liberty Road is broadcast on all platforms, Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcast, and more. If you like what you've heard, please follow, rate, and review Liberty Road on Apple Podcast and Spotify. It helps us to know if these episodes are inspiring and equipping you to move into your middle third with intention. Liberty Road is created by executive producer Netta Jones, supervising producer Elizabeth Windham, producer Julia Windham, and music by Jack Jones. Miracles do happen. A gorgeously imaginative new musical is now on Broadway. Water for Elephants is a New York Times critic's pick. It's stunning, emotional, spellbinding entertainment. A dazzling love story, propulsive with passion. Don't miss the best new musical on Broadway. Water for Elephants. Get tickets now at telecharge.com and choose the ride. When you make decisions for your company, you look for the no-brainers. And if you have a lot of mailing to do, Stamps.com is the ultimate no-brainer. 
It streamlines your processes to make your business more efficient, which makes you less busy. Mail checks, invoices, legal documents, and everything you need to keep your business running with Stamps.com. Seamlessly connect with every major marketplace and shopping cart. Schedule package pickups and see your cheapest and fastest shipping options from different carriers. With rates up to 89% off USPS and UPS rates. And with the Stamps.com mobile app, you can take care of mailing and shipping wherever you are. Make the same no-brainer decision as over 1 million other businesses with Stamps.com. Sign up with code PROGRAM for a 4-week trial, plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. That's stamps.com. Code program.